Would you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Lord, we come humbly seeking your guidance in these times that we are living through. Amen. <clears throat> yes, sirree. That's the way to start. We could end that way. You know, <clears throat> there are a lot of unusual tourist attractions in the United States. You may have seen some of them. A big ball of string and stuff like that. There's a museum in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and its unofficial name is the Museum of Failed Products. This museum looks like a standard supermarket or grocery store. However, all the items on the shelves are products that were taken off the market because nobody bought them. They just didn't want them. You kind of wonder why. Well, wouldn't you like to have some or buy some Clairol's Touch of Yogurt Shampoo? What do you think of that? Sounds yummy, don't you think? Oh, or Gillette's uh, For Oily Hair Only Shampoo. That sounds like a good product. Here's one, Pepsi's AM Breakfast Cola. Now that was supposed to compete with coffee as a, a morning pick-me-up. Why didn't we get excited about Colgate brand TV dinners? You know, I, I just don't know. But here's my favorite, here's my favorite, Fortune Snookies. Those are fortune cookies for your doggy. Doesn't your doggy like to read its fortune in the morning? I know Sally does. She'll read her fortune and then she goes and finds a spot of sun and sleeps all day. I think it's a pretty good deal. Then there was also caffeinated beer. Uh, microwavable scrambled eggs in a tube. And breath mints that look like pack, little packages of cocaine. Now, can you imagine the disappointment of the inventors who poured into their time and their energy and their intellect into creating a product, no matter how unusual it might be, only to have it fail. How disheartening would that be to have your creation end up in the museum of failed products? I wonder if God doesn't sometimes look at us, the very pinnacle of his creation, and wonder with much disappointment how we turned out the way we did. Is humanity one of God's failed products? It's something to think about as we get into the scripture for this morning from the book of Genesis. I'm going to read chapter 9. Verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you, Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign to the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all of life on the earth. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of those words for this morning. The Old Testament is 
full of just fantastic stories of every very ordinary people who possessed very extraordinary faiths. Consider Noah, this guy that we just read about. At God's direction, Noah built an ark. And it was an enormous proportions, 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. And Noah said to God, God, what's a cubit? And God said, well, Noah, it's about two inches shorter than two feet. This would make the ark over 450 foot long about the size of a uh, one and a half football fields. No wonder it took Noah 120 years to build it. And for that matter, he built it miles from any water. There was no sea near, anywhere near. And Noah's neighbors had a great laugh at his expense. They watched him building this boat and his kids and everything, you know, and they were just laughing. It, it was a comic relief for his neighbors. Noah, of course, had the last laugh, did he not? The rains came, the waters rose, there was destruction all over the earth. Only Noah, his family, and the animals, two of every species on earth, were spared. Now, for a year, they lived on that ark until finally the earth was dry and the Lord told Noah to go forth and repopulate the land. A rainbow appeared in the heavens, and God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters come a flood, become a flood and destroy all life. Now, <clears throat> the story of Noah and the great flood is one of the best known and best love stories in the Bible. It's the, probably the first story we teach our kids in Sunday school and Bible school and everything, and there's board games of it, and there's action figures, and there's all kind of things. Noah and the Ark. It's also one of the most important stories because it represents the beginning of the concept of a covenant relationship. A covenant is an agreement. God made an agreement with Noah and his family. And this is what he did. And it was an agreement between God and all creation at that point. And that point further. We are a covenant people. We come out of that covenant, that agreement. As descendants of Noah, we share in the benefits of the relationship which God established with his children. So, what are some of the implications or some of the things uh, that this covenant relationship has? What does it mean for our lives today as we sit here today? What does that covenant relationship mean to you or to me? There are two implications that are really stand out at this point. The first one sounds a little negative, but we need to give it some thought. We need to give it some serious thought. And here it is. God is disappointed even in the best of us. He's disappointed even in the best of everybody. Now, I hope that doesn't bust anybody's bubble. It's the central truth of the scriptures. God is disappointed even in the best of us. But the funny thing is that most of us don't look at it that way at all. 
we believe in our hearts, in our minds, that God is very fortunate to have us on his side. Yes, he is. God knew what he was getting into when he created human beings. God made us in his image. But out of his love for us, he, he gave us free will to choose our own path. What we will do, what we'll say, where we're going to go. And too often, we, too often we choose to put our own needs first. We're thinking about ourselves first, you see. In a speech made in 1863, Abraham Lincoln said this. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. In other words, there is a battle within the human heart. None of us is immune to that. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This sad truth presents a dilemma for God. It gives God a problem. He made us from the clay of the earth. He fashioned us in his own image. He breathed into us the breath of life, gave us the ability to love, to desire, to will. Even more significantly, he endowed us with the most precious gift of all, the freedom to choose. Unfortunately, sometimes we choose wrongly. Every one of us. You have choose wrongly, and you will choose wrongly again. Call it original sin if you want to. There is a basic flaw within our character. At times, God is disappointed even in the best of us. The story of Noah and the flood is the culmination of that disappointment. According to the writer of Genesis, God repented that he even made man. He just was repented of it. I'm sorry I made man. God was so disappointed in humanity that he decided to wipe the slate clean and start all over again. And he sent this great flood to destroy the life on earth, all life on earth, except, except he decides to save a remnant, a little piece, a little slice, a little sliver, just a little bit. Noah and his family and two of every kind of animal on the earth. Why did God choose Noah? Because he was the only righteous man left on the earth, according to the writer of Genesis. But notice this. After the waters subsided, after they went down, and he leaves the ark, what does Noah do? He falls into a tawdry sin that would have brought God's wrath under any circumstances. God chooses the only righteous man on earth at that time, and he turns out to be not so righteous after all. And you see, Noah's story is our story. It's us. Even at our best, we are not all God created us to be. None of us utilizes all of the potential and all of the ability and all of the talent in a constructive manner all the days of our life. We just don't. We are not the mothers we ought to be. We're not the fathers we ought to be. We're not the citizens we ought to be. We're not the church members we ought to be. We're not the pastors 
and preachers and ministers we ought to be. We're not the soldiers of Christ. We all fall short of the mark. And God is disappointed even in the best of us. So what does God do with his children in the light of that fact that we all fall short and we've all missed the mark? What's he, what's he supposed to do? We all have a little bit of rebellion in our souls. Feel like rebelling every now and again. What is God to do here? didn't work for him to destroy humanity and start over as he did with Noah. I mean, he knew that it would not be too long before humanity would slip back into the slime. So what is he supposed to do? Because you see, at this point, God had another problem. And it can be stated like this. Even though God is disappointed in the best of us, he is hopelessly and passionately in love with the worst of us. Think about that a minute. A man named Jürgen Moltmann was one of the most influential Christian theologians of the 20th century. He wrote books that influenced a generation of pastors. He was particularly known for his theology of hope. And in one of his books, he wrote this. But the ultimate reason for our hope is not to be found in what we want, wish for, and wait for. The ultimate reason is that we are wanted and wished for and waited for. God is our last hope because... We are God's first love. Amen? Huh? Think about that for a minute. God, the creator of all life, the source of all that is good, the very definition of good. God loves us. God created us in his image. He breathed his life into us. God made us into the special focus of his love. That's what we're about. And that it was the only, the only the beginning of God's plan for us. He had a lot of things in store for us. And see, that's the other part of the dilemma. God is disappointed in the best of us, but he is hopelessly and passionately in love with the worst of us. This dilemma forces God into a very unusual role. Actually, God's last word concerning this dilemma is not found in the story of Noah. It's not found in the New T Old Testament. It's found in the Gospels. Actually, it is the Gospel. Here's what God did. He made a covenant with us. He did it first with a rainbow. And later he did it with a cross. You see. This past week, we celebrated Ash Wednesday. Not as we normally celebrate Ash Wednesday, but Ash Wednesday was celebrated. The day that marks the beginning of the Lenten season. This is the time when we prepare to face the cross and Jesus' arrest, and his crucifixion, and his resurrection. Major Barbara Shearer served as a military chaplain in Kuwait. And she wrote about a time when a fire swept through the camp that she was at, and it destroyed five large army tents. And they were using these tents as a dining hall and a chapel for the services. Amazingly, the fire started right after breakfast, in between the times for the Protestant and Catholic services. No one was in the tents at the time. There were no fatalities. 
The fire also happened just a few days before Ash Wednesday. Major Shearer decided that instead of uh, burning the palm fronds and using the ashes from them for Ash Wednesday, she would ask and use some of the ashes from the burnt military tents to anoint the foreheads of the soldiers. After the fire cooled down, she got permission to visit the fire site. She took a firefighter with her and he scooped up a cup full of ashes, put them in a plastic bag and gave them to her. Later, as she was pouring the ashes into a bowl for the service, she spotted something shiny in the, in the ashes. And it was a small silver cross that had survived the fire. On it were inscribed the words, Jesus is Lord. The fire had burned through five very large military tents. Everything in the path of the fire was destroyed. How had the firefighter, in scooping up a random cup of ashes, managed to pick up the exact spot where the tiny cross lay hidden. Major Shear says, the message to me is clear. God walks with us through the terrible firestorms of our life, and we are lifted unharmed out of the ashes. We may be marked in some way like the cross of ashes on our foreheads on Ash Wednesday, but that mark is a symbol of God's love and protection. Remember that the next time you see a rainbow in the sky. God's plan to save the world started before God ever created the world. He sealed his promise with a rainbow and he made good on his promise with the cross. None of us are all we might be. But still somebody loves us and he sent his son to die for us. That, my friends, is the gospel. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's why you're here today. A father willing to welcome home a, dis a disobedient child. A father willing to take that child's place on the cross of Calvary. Amen? Amen. Amen. We are going to stand if you're able and we're going to sing. I'd like to sing the first and last verses. First and last. Have thy own way, Lord. Have thy own way. Thou art the Father, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Verse 4. Have thy own way. Absolute sway, fill with thy spirit, till all shall see Christ only always living in me. Lord, we pray that people see you in us. Have your own way with us, Lord. Guide and direct us and, and put us in positions that we can witness for you. We just ask, Lord, that you would go with us through life, through this day, through the rest of the week until we meet again. Doing the things that you would have us to do. And Lord, we just give you all the praise and the glory and until we meet again. Amen. We cry out.